Hello everyone, I'm Rachel Lowe from Physiopedia. Today I am delighted to be talking to Dr Tim Nunn and Dr Rick Gardner, who are both in Ethiopia. Hello to you both. Hi. Hi. Hello. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I'm very excited to talk to you about your work um, with Cure International and in Ethiopia and, and all the other work that you do. Um, we're going to talk today about neglected clubfoot and working with individuals um, with uh, older children with clubfoot who haven't had treatment. So, but before we get into all of that, maybe you could just in both introduce yourselves to the people that are um, watching this or listening that have never met you before. Sure. So. Uh, my name is Tim and uh, I've been working here in Ethiopia in Addis Ababa for three years and uh, a lot of, there are just a whole load of kids who are walking around with severe club feet, never been treated before and um, yeah, the route to Ethiopia was um, through training in the United Kingdom and in South Africa but I've always had a heart for Africa and it's great to be here. Um, thanks. I'm Rick. Yeah, thank you very much for this amazing opportunity and um, yeah, very happy to be here today. Um, so I've been in Ethiopia for four years. Um, yeah, did my training in the UK, fellowship in Toronto, spent time in Malawi and South Africa as well. And um, yeah, so this has, been, um, this has been a great period of time for myself and my family. Married like with Tim, we've got some young kids. And uh, yeah, no, thank you for this opportunity today. No, it's great to talk to you both. Um, um, thank you so much for your time. I, I know you've got quite a lot that you'd like to show us and talk to us about today, which I'm very excited about, but I just want to pick up on something that you just said, Tim. Can I ask you about sort of prevalence or of neglected clubfoot? Um, you just said you saw lots of children walking around with neglected clubfoot. Can you give us some kind of indication, obviously where you are uh, and mm. maybe in other places around the world of how common this is? Mm. Right. So uh, the in, in Ethiopia, I'll speak for Ethiopia because the prevalence and whatnot will change uh, around the world. But in Ethiopia, there are about 50 million children. And um, of all the children that are born, probably somewhere in the region of one in, in 750 will be born with club feet. Um, our, our infant club foot project covers about half of the population that are born with club foot. Um, so there are still a huge number that are untreated. Um, and, and that would be for any number of reasons. But the, I can, you, can, you can see that the, the numbers are getting massive. And there are a huge number of kids who um, will go through their life without knowing that there's treatment for it even just because of access to care is so restricted. Yeah, I mean, we treat um, is, is in within, so Cure um, takes care of the club foot care or supports the club foot care throughout the country. And we reach about 1,500 children a year. But as Tim said, it's what, three and a half, four thousand children who are there. And so it's a huge burden. And, uh, and it's something that gradually, you know, the challenges we, we see are ones which are met throughout the world, throughout the, um, throughout the developing world where access to care is very difficult. And, uh, and so we'll be dealing with the neglected club for, for another generation here in Ethiopia. Wow. Um, so, you know, it seems like it, it's quite a, it does seem like it's quite a prevalent problem and it seems like the work that you're doing out there is making a massive difference. So um, the, um, obviously the, being an older child with clubfoot can have a big impact on their lives. Um, I don't know if you, I know you've got some videos and some images to show us, so I don't know if you want to start with that to um, um, just to give us an introduction to all that you're going to talk to, about and then maybe we could come back to talking about some of the things that you've showed us. Is that coming up? It is, yeah. Tim, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, so uh, here we've got a a seven-year-old boy who's presented, you can see on, on the screen, um, with a moderate to severe club foot, uh, never been treated before. And uh, this, this is uh, on the other side of the screen, is his feet following treatment. And uh, this is with a Ponseti type of technique, with um, some limited surgery at the end of correction of the midfoot. 
So you can see the sort of thing that we're, we're trying to uh, uh, major and talk on uh, today is, is, is about the use of the Ponsetti technique in treating these neglected clubs, but not necessarily about the surgery. And if I can just uh, show you a, a, a short case example, uh, I think that might be helpful. This, this lad, he's six years of age, again, with a, a moderate to severe club foot. Um, he's come from a very rural area. And uh, he started off with casting. And uh, we're going to talk about the, the various ways that we cast it. But um, he went through a series of casts of uh, eight eight separate casts uh, done every two weeks and you can see um, that's one of his legs undergoing the treatment there and this is the kind of position he's getting to after about six casts and then a couple more casts were applied and then you can see following some limited surgery this is his position standing up after his treatment and then uh, this is one year after his treatment and you can see him walking with um, good feet, which are flexible and painless, and planted grace. And this lad is, is playing football with his friends. Um, so uh, this, is, this is what the, the treatment we, we'd like to uh, go into some detail about, and particularly the physio role in, in, in that treatment would be great. The, um, uh, those images you show are amazing. It, it, um it's good to see uh, the massive impact that um, working with these children can have on their lives. And it's so nice to see that video at the end. So yes, yeah, so um, perhaps, yeah, just talk away, um, share your knowledge, whatever you'd like to share with us, whatever you think's important, um, a, a good place to start. That would be great. Yes. So it's as, more than just the physical problems that these kids are encountering. There's a huge uh, psychological and social issue, which is um, also very apparent when we're treating these kids. So um, two girls come to mind immediately when we're talking about this issue. They, they, were, they were sisters and they, were, came, they came down from the north of the country and the parents were desperate for treatment. And they had not actually seen a doctor before. In fact, they had not seen many of their community before. They'd been kept inside, inside their houses because of the deformity and the shame that that would bring the, the family if they were left at, let outside. They had not been to school, even though the oldest was six years of age. Um, and, and this is a quite a common story. And amongst the, the patients that we see, a lot of them are excluded from their social surroundings. And um, they come to us and it's quite, a, it's quite a trauma to get over the psychological and social issues. And then into adult life, of course, these, these children uh, take those problems with them. And in addition to that, which is the untreated club foot in our adult life, which we do see, um, has problems with pain. And that's, that's usually we find it's pain where they've been walking on, on the sort of the top surface of the foot, the dorsum of the foot, which becomes weight bearing. And there's a, you know, the, 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 the pressures are very high and the surface area where they're actually contacting the ground is very small. It's like walking on pebbles and particularly, you know, walking on hard ground or stone or something like that, they do get pain. And they don't have much balance. They don't have any push off to their gait. Uh, so it's essentially like walking on peg legs and to have one foot like that is bad enough. But if you've got two foot like that, the, the actual functional limitations are quite substantial. Um, so that's, that's what happens if we, if we sort of leave them alone. And, and we do see adults with this condition quite frequently. So we just wanted to talk about why we're moving away from uh, a very invasive surgical approach to the Ponsetti technique, which we found to be helpful for these kids. Yeah, um, we've got the model issue. I have the, um, so yeah, so, so we used to treat them very differently. Um, so these children, when they would come, um, we, we would do conventional surgery. So when your son is a club foot model, 
we would do what we call a posterior medial release. And we would start up high along the back edge of the tibia, and then we'd um, zip the foot, coming right the way down past the Achilles tendon, and then right the way underneath the medial malleolus, all the way down to the medial aspect of the, uh, of the big toe. And it's, uh, the posterior medial release is the, is the workhorse for traditional club foot management. Um, prior to Ponsetti, it was done for the, the infants. Um, but certainly it's still probably the most established technique for children under the age of 10. Um, but it does involve lengthening all the tendons, opening up the major joints, the talonbicular joint, the ankle joint, the subtalar joint, um, and, to, uh, and to lengthen all the long flexors to the toes as well as tibialis posterior. Now, the end result is you do have this big, long scar on the inside here. You have a foot that is corrected and looks cosmetically good for a photograph. But gradually over time, all that scar tissue on the inside of the foot contracts down, it gets tight, and it pulls the foot into an adducted position. You get early recurrence. And actually, it's a difficult problem to treat. When you've got a surgically operated foot, uh, it's something that we do see them sometimes, and they're a much more complicated problem. So about three years ago, um, you're really following the lead from other places around the world, in India and Nepal and some places in South, South America. And actually, a, um, an Ethiopian colleague of ours who works at the big government hospital who are increasingly using Ponsetti for these older children, um, we started using a slightly modified version of the, of the Ponsetti using the same technique, but just some differences that I think Tim will talk about in a bit regarding manipulation time and handhold. But started using that and then actually seeing the children saw the videos from, we weren't getting results like that in the long term for the surgically operated feet. The feet that we're finding following this, they're flexible, they're pain free, the children function really well. Um, and we are completely dependent upon the quality of our, of our colleagues, the physiotherapists we have working with us to provide these casts and doing an amazing job for these children. Um, and actually, we wouldn't go back. So for us, for the older child under the age of 10, using Ponsetti followed by a more limited surgical approach has really been giving you know, us results that uh, the parents and, and us have been very, very happy with. Um, it's probably worth commenting on just what we would do for the older children. So the Ponsetti side of things, we found to be effective for the children under age of 10. When they get over the age of 10, then actually the foot does become stiff. Now, some early teenagers will still respond, but the ones who come along, children who come along untreated, 15, 16, 17, we will give them a surgical treatment, one whereby we would do an initial soft tissue release along the inside of the foot, a bit more limited compared to the posterior medial release, and then it will be a bony correction by doing what we call a midfoot osteotomy or a triple osteotomy, whereby we actually excise the joints around the, the hind foot and make a full correction. Um, it's definitely inferior to those ones we can treat with the Ponsetti, um, but, um, but it is possible to get a plantar grade foot that points straight ahead and is, works well in the shoe. Um, so it's been a big change for us. What you're doing, I mean, what you're doing, the work you're doing sounds amazing. And it sounds, um, to go from the um, surgical procedure, which is massive, which we can see is massively invasive, to um, doing the simple, more simplified Ponsetti method with these children is is a, is a huge step forward. So um, I, I'm guessing that you're seeing some really good results and, um, and, and the children with the less invasive technique, probably, I'm hoping the outcomes, I'm guessing the outcomes are better. Mm, that's right. I mean, up until the, about the age of about three, we can use the, 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 you know, the basic Ponsetti technique with weekly cast change and things like that. Um, and then following correction, uh, foot abduction, bracing, um, and almost exactly as we would for an infant. And we found that that works up to the age of three, really quite reliable. Maybe, maybe, maybe a, a, a further few casts are required. Um, but the foot re retains that flexibility to get a really good and speedy uh, correction. Between the age of three and ten, um, like re Rick said, we we're, we've moved to this modified Ponsetti manipulation and casting technique with limited surgery. After that, and, and then full activity without without any splints or anything like that afterwards. And then, and as Rick said, for the older ones, then. A different 
uh, surgical model is required, different surgical um, plan is required, because they're often much stiffer. So uh, we just wanted to go through a little bit more detail how we um, assessed the club foot and then how we uh, uh, did the casting, if that's okay. So uh, the assessment of the club foot, um, obviously we we start off by looking at the patient and the relatives and asking uh, questions about whether the club foot uh, was, uh, whether it came at birth um, and um, whether they're getting pain from it. Um, are there any other family members with club foot and other things? Um, and we want to get a, a good picture of their social circumstances before embarking on the foot. Um, but when, when we get to the foot, we, we tend to look at the deformities within the foot and to see how correctable they are with gentle manipulation. So, for example, I think you can see here there's, there's plantaris within the foot. Um, cavus is difficult in an older foot to, uh, to comment on uh, without an x-ray. But plantaris, we can actually measure that um, reasonably accurately. And um, you, you can see that, uh, that there are elements to the Ponseti, uh, sorry, to the Pirani scoring system and to the Demeglio scoring system, which are not appropriate in the walking foot, such as, for example, the posterior crease, the medial crease, which are generally not seen in the walking club foot. Also, we found that there are certain things like the prominence of the, uh, the Taylor head and the um, uh, the, the ability to, to feel that the calcaneus is, is more difficult and to judge those Pirani scoring elements is more difficult. So we're, we're looking here at just measuring deformities within the foot. And here um, you can see it's the plantaris. Um, and here is the adductus. So we've turned the patient around, looking at the sole of the foot and measuring how much adductus there is with a goniometer at the bottom of the foot and another component of the walking child with uh, neglected club foot here you can see a mild degree of varus uh, equinus deformity which is at the ankle joint which you, you can separate the equinus from the ankle joint from that which is plantaris within the foot and this is just measuring the deformity in the ankle joint and then finally a rotation of the foot around the tailor's head and you can see that my thumb is near the tailor's head there and that's measuring an angle um, with a, cor a, a moderate correcting force uh, looking at see how severe this club foot is and using those those five elements comprising the acronym PAVER P -A -V -E -R, um, we we are able to score these feet into a severity um, a severity scoring system, which we then will encompass uh, their age as well to give us an overall idea of whether these feet are going to respond correctly to casting. So we know that the very severe ones in an older patient will be resistant to casting. And the less severe ones will respond to casting. And it's about 10 percent, in our, in our experience, about 10 percent that will be cast resistant. So, so in the older child, you do this assessment and the outcome of the assessment determines um, the approach to treatment. So some may just be respond to casting and others you'll need to do more of the minor surgical techniques and manipulation. Is that correct? So, yeah, so the, the casting we know will, will, will work for the vast majority of those that, that are moderate and mild in our scoring system. Those that are severe, we know that casting is unlikely to get us the whole, the whole distance. So we know from the start that four and a half months of casting is not going to get them to that final destination of needing limited surgery. We're going to have to take another route for that. So um, we've, we found the assessment of the stiffness of the foot and combination with the age of the child between the ages of three and 10 to be quite useful. 
and um, we would like to share that uh, scoring system, if we may, on, on your website. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so so let, let, let's just talk talk a little bit out about this the limited surgical uh, treatment um, after the casting has been uh, successful, and then we'll return to the Ponsetti technique itself. Is sure. that okay? Yeah, yeah. So so after the the casts have been performed, and as Tim said, it's typically around six to eight casts have been applied. Um, we would take the cast off and then look at the flexibility of the foot. And if the foot is correcting, not to the 70 degrees of external rotation that you would do for the infant club foot, but to a point whereby it's flexible beyond neutral and the tailor head is reduced, that would be a point when we would say, well, actually this foot's ready for surgery. It's not possible due to the really prolonged, the, le the length and lateral column and the short and medial column to get that degree of external rotation in the neglect of club foot. There's anatomical change within the foot that are fixed. Um, but you can get that foot around to a point whereby it is corrected beyond neutral. And at that point, we would then do the limited surgery, which would be an Achilles tendon lengthening. And, and we would not do a full tenotomy in these older children because we wouldn't want to defunction the gastrocilius complex. But we'd do a careful lengthening which is three incisions along the back, um, in order to do a step lengthening of the tendon that slides, the tendon's in continuity, but it comes to a lengthened state. We will then bring the foot up as far as that foot is able to come. Now we used to do a posterior ankle capsulotomy. So open up the back and divide the capsule at the back for those feet which don't come all the way. We now no longer do that. And we do a cast wedge whereby the, the cast which is on the foot we leave it on the foot, we take a large wedge around the anterior aspect of the ankle, we take that piece of cast out, the foot reliably comes up another 15 degrees one week later, we leave that cast on, and then that foot is ready for the second stage. So once that foot has achieved a good 15 degrees of dorsiflexion, they come back the following week, the cast comes off, we recess the abductor hallucis, which can be a varus deforming force, and then at that point, we would do a tibialis anterior tendon transfer. And much in the same way as we would do for the uh, for the three-year-old club foot, uh, it can be a two incision, can be a three incision, bringing out above the extensor retinaculum, and we'll pass it through the lateral cuneiform. We, we, we no longer take it through to the cuboid because the foot is well corrected and there's a risk of actually overcorrection. We still take it to the lateral cuneiform there. Um, and then that patient would then go home. It's been a long, a long old haul for the patients, their family at that point. They then go home. The, they're in a long leg cast at that point, but we don't cast the, the knees at 90 degrees. We have them in a much more gentle position, somewhere between 45 and 60, because they can. Their knees too can get stiff after a prolonged period of time in cast. Six weeks after the tendon transfer, they then come out of cast and they walk. Uh, we no longer... Put them in an ankle foot orthosis after their posterior medial releases they have to go in ankle foot orthosis during much of the growing stages of their life but they have the long haul for the time in cast they come out of cast they have their surgery and they come out of cast and then they mobilize and so there's no need for additional splintage thereafter does that make sense it does in my limited knowledge of clubfoot it makes it's very good to hear you talk about that and it's very interesting the differences in approach and and the new approach that you have now as well um i don't know if you have much more to talk about the actual approach to your side of the work with an individual with clubfoot or an older child because i'm now wondering how the rehabilitation after the casting comes off um, is different if at all in an older child yeah, so that's a really good question. So the, the, the rehabilitation really has to start during the cast treatment. We have to get those, um, those hip flexors working and uh, hip extensors and, and work, keep working on sort of the core muscles before the cast comes off. Um, and then once it does come off, they, they will start, I mean, uh, as you know, kids kids do 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 a lot by themselves, but they do need a lot of encouragement as well sometimes. And to have a group of kids all doing the same thing is a great thing. Um, so we do have facilities for that, for them to all be playing together, and um, you know, 
if 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 the football's not there, then we're sort of asking the questions really. Uh, but but we we would like to see them progress quickly on to on to playing out as much as much as possible. Um, and here in Ethiopia, we do have uh, a lot of sunshine, and kids are outdoors a lot, which does which does help. And um, in addition, we have targeted physio program for ankle. Uh, range of movement and um, to after the range of movement has been achieved then for power I tend to find that uh, the tibialis anterior tendon transfer is is tensioned quite tight and when I see them back in clinic I obviously we, we check to see if it's intact and it's intact but uh, that takes a little while to stretch out actually it doesn't happen over weeks it's it's usually over months and I'm happy with it being that way and for them to gradually improve the range of movement that they're getting in their ankle joints. Um, and so, so we, we, do, we do have a, um, a program for rehab and we'd be happy to share that as well on the website. I did want to just briefly talk about the slight differences that there are in the Ponsetti casting technique um, for doing these feet. They're bigger feet, and I think they're easier feet to cast because um, uh, little feet, you can forget where the talus is and whatnot, but here you can see it. Um, it's not difficult to, to see where, where the uncovered talus is. So the first stage in the casting is the same as Ponsetti, is to get the cavus eliminated. And we keep going with the cavus elimination cast until that is eliminated. We don't do one cast and then swap to the abduction around the talus head. We keep going with the cavus casting. And I think that's a key fact, a key thing, which is um, it, can be, it can be tempting to proceed, but actually you have to have the discipline to do maybe three or four cavus casts. There's typically 10 minutes of pre-casting manipulation. So finding out where your, where your fingers are going to rest, where your, the base of your thumb is going to be, because doing uh, casting in an older child, you're not using the tip of your thumb as much. You're using the base of your thumb. And we, when we first started out in this, we did have one or two kids that had little skin marks and areas where thumbs have been pressed in too hard. And we since learned that the base of the thumb is more important uh, than the tip of the thumb. Then the cast is applied. And it definitely takes two or three people to do that in an, in an older child. And molding of the cast in this, exactly the same way uh, that Ponsetti has advocated. Uh, like Rick said, they're all long leg casts, just the same, uh, with 60 degrees of knee flexion. And... Um, so the cavus is done first and then the abduction around the tailored head and the cast typically changed every two weeks rather than weekly. We have run some patients with bilateral club feet, um, changing cast every week and compared it with changing cast every two weeks. And we tend to find that they're both going about this, correcting about the same speed. So, uh, we find there's a little bit less pain and problems with doing it every two weeks and that works out fine and we we tend to limit the number of casts to nine so nine casts would be equivalent of four and a half months of treatment and it's a massive ask for parents guardians and for the children um, but when we see the the feet flexible and and um the child walking well, being able to hop and run afterwards, we think it's probably is worth all of that effort. Of course, we, we do like to see the kids having some painkillers before they have the, the cast changes. And uh, like Rick mentioned, we're aiming for the resting position just beyond neutral rather than that hyperabducted position. So um, is there any... Any other points you'd like to ask about the, the casting technique? No. Okay. <laughs> I 
I, th I mean, I think you've explained it's it's um, it's a really nice explanation of um, how it differs from the normal Ponsetti uh, casting technique in a, in an older child, which is um, great to hear you explain that. So thank you. Pleasure. Was there anything else that you wanted to continue to share about the um, management approach? It, over those four and a half months that you are working on the casting techniques with the child? Mm. Yeah. Um, I, I think initially, um, initially for the surgeon, when you first step out, or the, or, the, or the physiotherapist, when you first step out into doing Ponsetti for these kids, you kind of don't believe that it's possible. And it's then only you only see after like two, three or four casts, actually something really is really, really on the move there. Um, so uh, that there is a that there is sort of encouragement to uh, in, in just patience and persistence with the casting and not to giving up, to, not giving up too early. Uh, the, the, the kids themselves they do have to be with, with a group of other kids undergoing treatment. Otherwise, uh, it, 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 would be, it would be a difficult place for them. So we do love to have them stay with us or stay with a, a partner organization while they're undergoing this treatment. Um, they, um, they're generally not in, not in a lot of pain. And if there are children in a lot of pain, we do remove the cast pretty pretty quickly, um, and yeah, it's it's it, it's it's a chance for them to um, also to you know to focus on on other things as well. Um, we, we encourage them to to bring games and books and that, that kind of thing. Um, it, we, we, we don't we we, we do. We do upfront tell the parents all about the need for perhaps five or six months of treatment, and they, they must be prepared for that. And and that I think is the the waiting game for that is as I said worthwhile, but needs to be explained up front, front really clearly. Do you do you want to add anything, Rick? No, 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 no. It's um, I think we've definitely covered it. It's uh, it's been a great thing for us to see. I mean, we we really did see early recurrences and problems with the surgically managed one. And, and really just to echo Tim's thought that um, when we thought about doing Ponsetti or had others doing Ponsetti in these older children, we were, we were skeptical, but it really does work. And um, it's, uh, it, it's, been, it's been a great thing. So we hope that more people will do it. We hope that less people do the big soft tissue releases and, uh, and we'll invest in the time because uh, they'll see it's really worthwhile. Yeah. It, I mean, it does sound like a, a really big improvement um, and yeah, just it's, it's an easier technique to, for the children to experience, isn't it? Um, one of the questions on my mind is what, with this um, group of children, with the older child going through this um, management process over six months, have you said, are there any things in particular, issues in particular that, um, that the healthcare provider or the person working with the child should keep an eye out for? Are there any, is there anything that can go wrong? Anything that we really need to pick up on early um, that we should be looking out for over the period of time that we spend with the children? I, I, I think the first thing to say is that um, embarking on this treatment should be, should be joint between physio, physiotherapist and surgeon. It can't be just one or the other. Um, and the, the there should be shared goals and shared expectations and things like that. So it's really important to have that. Of course, they're all going to require surgery at the end anyway. Um, and yeah, to, ha to have uh, a good good team dynamic there, um, and and you know, with 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 people that you 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 you, uh, you get on well with is is important. Um, in in terms of looking out for problems as you go along. Uh, we actually have had a f have had a few issues early on, whereby we tried to put the the first cast on with too much stretch, and we've had to remove the casts. Um, but that's probably only one or two patients. 
in the last 300. So, I mean, we would see and be casting more than more than about 150 to 200 every year. So from from my from my recollection, there are very, very rarely problems. We've had one or two cases that have got uh, cast problems because they've got infections underneath the cast. Um, and if, uh, if, if an infection is present, uh, what would we see? What would we be picking that, that up was, on? That was mostly from having an infestation of, of um, scabies underneath the cast or something like that. So I do tend to treat that before getting going on the cast thing. We've had problems with chicken pox and chicken lesions underneath the cast. But I, I haven't had any, um, any se severe uh, problems with pressure pressure areas um, and if, if if we did see that we would just uh, put them in a resting cast until that until that settled down um, I think it's for, for me I do quite like to review the cases every six weeks or so to check on progress um, and um, you know that as you said if we if you're approaching you're approaching nine casts and there's still a lot of deformity in the in the midfoot then it's it's time to take a uh, probably probably time to take stock of that to quit the casting and to go on to an alternative surgical solution at the moment we're te we're trialing out doing um, the triple arthrodesis uh, with these kids so removing joints in the hind foot yeah, the, the, the telecalcaneal joint, the calcaneal cuboid joint, and the telenavicular joint, fusing them together, um, and, and seeing if that is a better treatment than using an external fixator to get the residual correction. Uh, so that's something we're unsure on, and we're currently conducting a trial to look at. Okay, so those we've covered some of the things there in the to look out for during the treatment process. Is there anything that may happen after the six months, maybe when, um, you know, after the treatment's finished, as the child gets older, is there anything that's different about um, the child that has had their treatment at an older age compared to the infant, say? Yeah. Um, we wouldn't expect their, their function to be as good. Um, and you know we they they of course you know they're still a club foot the, the foot's still going to be short the, the calf is still going to be wasted but after some time after a year so in the year follow-ups that we're seeing they are getting something of a calf back some shape of a calf some of them are able are able to to hop but most most are not able to hop easily you know using using their tricep suri. Um, I think I think most of them are able to toe walk and heel walk and I'd be disappointed if they weren't able to do that. So um, the level of function is um, is expected to be good but w I don't think I don't think we could expect them ever to be as good as if they were treated as an infant. Yeah. Um, um, we have had a few cases, as Rick alluded to, where the foot has, in fact, through the poncity casting, overcorrected. And these, these are cases whereby they are bilateral. One, case, one foot is mild and the other one is severe. And typically we've said, OK, well, instead of you having the mild one treated straight away, we'll treat them both together. We'll wait for the more severe one to catch up. And so these kids will be in cast for a long time on the mild side. And we found that that is the side that tends to go into an overcorrection. So as soon as a foot is ready for surgery, with the talus covered, with it going into slight passive abduction, um, with the heel swinging into a little bit of valgus or neutral valgus, we will then take that foot and treat that foot and deal with the other foot when it when it is ready, so I think that's an important thing just to mention to prevent correction. What do you think? Yeah, no, nothing to add. Yeah, so we've.
covered. You've both covered quite a lot there. Um, it's been a, a great explanation of the way your approach to how you're working with the older child um, with Clubfoot. Um, is there anything that uh, we haven't talked about or you haven't covered that you would like to mention? I think um, I think I think that's probably enough for a listener to endure. <laughs> um. You have covered a lot. It's been it's been fascinating to hear. Um, um, for I, I suppose, and it's really good to hear you comment on some of the things that we should be looking out for. We, you know, as as physiotherapists, as other healthcare providers that would be involved in the care as well. Um, so that's all good to hear. Um, and, and it's absolutely fascinating to see, not fascinating, it's amazing to see um, how well um, you are managing to, to give these children their function back, which is really good to see and which was demonstrated in the video um, and sounds like um, things like the group, um, the groups that the children get into to play all sounds absolutely great. And I'm guessing that that group play situation or the you know when the children are all together um this with the children that have the same um condition i i'm thinking back to where we started at the beginning that the um sort of psychological um components of this um of the child child with the neglected club foot the the coming back to the group play with um similar children is a big part of that for them so um, so it all sounds like a very good story. Um, is there anything else that you would both like to comment on? So unfortunately we lost Tim and Rick there um, due to a poor internet connection. I did manage to connect up with them again but failed to uh, record the last uh, short conversation that we had. Um, I, I just wanted to thank them for sharing all their knowledge with us. It's definitely um, very exciting work that they are doing with the older child with Clubfoot, um, with neglected Clubfoot. Um, Rick just explained that, you know, there is a lot of stigma associated with Clubfoot in children and with the families and in relation to the social um, effects that it can have on a family and a child with them not being able to go to school and um, things like that. And so, um, People just uh, need to know that, you know, particularly um, people around the world should know that, you know, this is, a, this is a condition that affects children all over the world and uh, children all over the world are treated in exactly the same way. So um, they are making great strides in um, helping children with Clubfoot and I'm really pleased to have spoken to them today. Um, Tim and Rick both work for Cure International uh, who have clinics all over the world and they do great work with uh, children in, with different conditions, one of those being Clubfoot. So thanks to Tim and Rick for sharing their knowledge with us today. Um, we will be able to share some of their resources and some of the things they talked about as well. So keep up the good work and thank you for sharing your knowledge with us today.